I wanted to talk to you today uh, about is the subject of fluctuations. You know, everybody has an idea of fluctuations. Are they like deviations from the average? But what I want to tell you uh, is that in statistical mechanics, fluctuations, of course, are inevitable. But more than being inevitable, they are really the heart of the matter. You know, if you have a system which is a large system, let's say a thermodynamic system like we usually deal with, uh, of course, we're very interested in computing the thermodynamic properties and so on and so forth using statistical mechanics. But beyond that, the small uh, changes in these uh, quantities which happen tell us a lot about the system. And this is what I want to uh, basically talk about today. Okay. So here's an outline of my talk. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, to first of all say uh, that uh, fluctuations tell you how a system behaves. You know, uh, uh, we will come in a little more detail to this uh, point. What do I mean by behaves? And what I mean is precisely uh, said in the second line, that if you have a system and you perturb it slightly, you change some parameters slightly, for instance, you put on a field or something like that, and then, of course, the system will respond to that. But the way it responds is a measure of its behavior, and what I'm going to argue is that the, the response, the way it responds, is actually determined by the fluctuations. Okay, so this is the importance of fluctuations. It tells you how systems behave. So, uh, so after telling you in a more, somewhat general context about this, I'll also tell you a little bit about specific systems um, and some uh, ways in which this line of argument has been used in the past and maybe also in the present, at present times. So I'll, the first and very important and crucial um, uh, application of this idea came in order to determine Avogadro's number. You know, everybody knows. And, you know, it's one of these things, strange things that if you go to a classroom and ask uh, the students, what is Avogadro's number? They'll all reply in unison. And they'll all say 6.023 times 10 to the 23. The, the, the reason I find it somewhat amazing is that they always quote it to, you know, uh, uh, three decimal places. But if you ask for other things like speed of light or speed of sound, nobody will know the answer to this level of accuracy. But uh, anyway, sorry, this is besides the point. I mean, I'm meandering. Uh, what I wanted to say is that Avogadro's number, of course, is a, a crucial number in science. But Avogadro did not know what the number was. You know, it took uh, several uh, years before the number was known. And the way it came about uh, is uh, what I'll tell you about today. Also, the study of critical phenomena, the behavior of uh, phenomena near the critical point, which is a very special point in the phase diagram of a fluid or a magnet, is uh, also uh, uh, totally governed or dominated by fluctuations is uh, the, the point I wanted to make. And finally, I'll talk about fluctuations in current carrying systems, systems that carry a current. Now, when you tell a physics audience, you know, there's a system which carries a current, they think of electrons in a wire, something like that. But my systems are going to be different. They're going to be cars on a road. So, you know, if you think of a road and cars moving by, there's a current uh, of... Uh, you know, vehicles that are going by. And uh, or if you think of a crowd uh, at Churchgate Station moving towards the train, there's a current of people moving in that direction. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about fluctuations in current carrying systems vis-a-vis -vis traffic and crowds. Okay, so this is the rough plan of my talk. Let me proceed. So let me remind you what statistical mechanics is all about. Right? I mean... The aim or the idea is to relate interactions on a small scale to the properties on a large scale. The, by large scale, I mean the scale of macroscopic physics, centimeters, maybe millimeters, maybe meters. But a small scale will mean atomic dimensions. 
So, for example, if we know the, what the force is like between two uh, hydrogen molecules as here, can we predict, for instance, the refractive index of a, be of a beaker of water? You know, so th this is the uh, aim or the, uh, uh, this is the, what the uh, task that statistical mechanics tries to accomplish. And the central problem, the basic problem in accomplishing this is that the number of possible microscopic arrangements is overwhelmingly large. And overwhelmingly large, meaning exponentially large in a number which is like the Avogadro number. Namely, it's e raised to 10 to the 23. It's a hugely huge number. And uh, this is the central problem. This is why calculating uh, quantities in statistical mechanics is difficult. Coming to fluctuations, what is a fluctuation? So the best thing to do, you know, whenever you encounter a word is to look up a dictionary. So in the Oxford English Dictionary, you'll find a fluctuation is an irregular rising and falling in number or amount. It's a variation. So for instance, uh, on the left, I have this figure um, where I have this sort of blotchy um, uh, dusty sort of uh, uh, environment and clearly what I have is fluctuations of the density. I move across from left to right there are strong fluctuations of the density and if I were to plot therefore the density as a function of how far I'm trying to, I'll see something like this figure on the right uh, in the center sorry so there are ups and downs as I cross large and small densities. So this is a di different depiction of the same uh, fluctuations that you see in, in the picture on the left. Given this uh, sort of up, down, jagged, uh, fluctuating um, uh, signal, what you could choose to do is to put a line across, like blue line, red line, and just count how many times this uh, erratic signal cuts this blue line. That number is proportional to the probability of having that value of the density. And so you can build up by doing this successively over and over again, a histogram or, you know, finally a distribution of the, the way the quantity is distributed. I mean, so these are three different depictions of fluctuations. One is the picture itself, here's the signal and here's the distribution. Now, the interesting thing about fluctuations in, uh, you know, systems that are, uh, uh, that, that we deal with is that a fluctuate, the fluctuations are correlated in space. Let me spend a minute saying what I mean by that. Uh, uh, it, 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 you know, it, it's possible to imagine systems in which you have no correlations. I mean, in the sense that if you have a large density at one point, uh, very close by, you may or may not have a large density again, but often the, it is the case that the things are correlated and these correlations, the fact that, uh, you know, what happens at one place influences something uh, at another place, that fact has very far reaching consequences. Okay, and as I said, fluctuations actually govern how the system behaves. Why are they interesting at all? Okay, I mean, first of all, as I said, they tell you a little bit about response to external influences. For instance, if I imagine I have a system, let's say of spins maybe, or an alloy or a two component system like here, and I do something, I perturb it by adding a very local perturbation here by adding a field here, the fact is that there will be a response to that which will be felt far away. This is felt far away because there are correlations between fluctuations at different points. The fact that there's a fluctuation that you've induced here will in fact in, have a repercussion far away. And uh, this response, as I said, is basically due to the fact that you allow and do have fluctuations. At the critical point um, of uh, a fluid, you, you, uh, students, you will remember in the PT plane, you have uh, you know uh, the uh, a point at which the locus of first order phase transitions between liquid and vapor that terminates. That terminus point is called a critical point, 
and at that point very special things happen what happens is that fluctuations which are there everywhere become the dominant feature here and uh, underlie everything fluctuations can also destroy ordered states but it's also possible to have strange states in which you have uh, enormous fluctuations but you manage to preserve the notion of order i mean i may not talk about this today but these are very interesting systems that we have okay averages versus fluctuations so i just wanted to see i mean i've stressed fluctuations so much that you might think that you know uh, nothing else matters it's not that that of course is not the case if you have a very large system the first thing you should do is of course look at the average value for instance if i have a gas uh, with molecules all over uh, i have uh, densities which are slightly different from one place to the other but if i want to find the average density i'll need to add up all the, the the find the total number of particles divided by the total volume and that of course has a lot of information in it it tell it it helps to describe the system so all of thermodynamics the equation of state the way we formulate thermodynamics uh does uh rely on uh quantities like density for flu um, fluids or solids or the magnetization for a magnetic system which i've defined here i mean so but notice these average values around n and m respectively so this is an average it's an average value over <coughs> either position different locations in space or uh, at a fixed location in space as you let time go by you will find that this quantity fluctuates and you take the average so of course averages tell you something but fluctuations tell us how it how the system behaves and uh, i'm repeating myself but if i do a ping ping now has become a popular word uh, in uh, many contexts but if i ping the system by you know uh, adding uh, a particle here or doing something like that the the question i would ask is what is the response how does this says uh, a point far away know about this and to what extent does it know so th- once we know a little more about fluctuations we'll be able to answer this so let let me move on how do we go ahead and formulate anything well of course the framework is something that you all are familiar with students i'm uh, talking to you all uh, primarily i mean of course others are there in the audience but you know uh, students you all have uh, all taken a course or are taking a course on statistical mechanics and uh, as i said the system has many components which interact with each other for instance molecules make up a fluid spins make up a magnet and the aim is of course to relate small scale properties to those on a large scale so how do we do that well we have configurations and the configuration is a very detailed um enumeration of uh, positions and momenta of all the molecules in the system so it's a huge a uh, file if you're thinking of a uh, you know some uh, in, in, uh, uh, storing this information um and uh, in magnetic systems for instance in simple magnetic systems where the spin can be only up or down what you would n- need to do is to list what each spin is doing so that will tell you what a configuration is so configuration is absolutely detailed it tells you exactly what every small little entity in your system is doing so here is your spin configuration s1 s2 up through sn and that uh, will specify what you have. but but of course the central problem is again i repeat uh, that the number of configurations is humongous i mean if you have a system of this sort with a a square like this there are 16 spins in this square the number of configurations clearly because each square can hold a spin which is up or down is 2 raised to 16 but if i increase the size of the square to 1000 then i have 1000 by 1000 square so that's a million right at number of spins 10 to the 3 times 10 to the 3 
So two times, two raised to the power of one million is not a trivial number. It's a very large number. And by the time you make your system to be macroscopically large, this number gets overwhelmingly large. And this is the, you know, this is why statistical mechanics remains a subject of study even today. You know, I mean, it's uh, how do you tackle this uh, system with so many uh, options of configurations that it has? And how do you find average values of fluctuations in such systems? Well, again, so this is something that I'm sure the students are familiar with. Uh, what we often do is we, depending on the um, uh, situation at hand, I mean, what I mean is the physical situation at, at hand, where, where you may have a system in which you have specified the energy E and the number of particles N, well, then what you could do is you could find how many configurations there are with a particular energy E and number N. So what the other way to do it is to sum over all configurations with energy E and number N and sum what? I sum, sum over one. In other words, every time I have a configuration with energy E and number N, I'll count one. And then I have another one and one and one. And if I add up all the ones, I'll get the total number that I want. And of course, the importance of this capital omega is that the entropy of the system, which is a, an in, uh, one of the cardinal uh, thermodynamic properties of the system, for that specified value of energy and number is given by the log of omega. So you see, this is the trans translation or transcription between the microscopic quantities, which tell you how many uh, options there are, and the entropy, which is a measurable thermodynamic quantity. But of course, you may have a system in which you don't specify the energy. Rather, you specify, instead of the energy, the temperature. The moment you do that, of course, what you need to do is not add up the number one, but you need to add up these uh, weights, W-E-I-G-H-T-S, weights, which are Boltzmann uh, weights, namely the probability uh, proportional to the probability of occurrence of an configuration with energy E, it's exponential of minus E by KT. Now, if I sum over all configurations in which N, the number N is still fixed, I'll get a quantity which, uh, you again, you are probably familiar with. This is the partition function. And if I take the log of that, I will be able to derive the Helmholtz free energy. So remember, N is fixed, but the energy can fluctuate. So here is something that fluctuates. Now, if something fluctuates, let's try to characterize, uh, you know, how strong is the fluctuation. So one way to do it is simply to look at the mean squared fluctuation, defined as delta E, uh, the whole squared, as uh, e squared, E average minus average E the whole squared, right? I mean, you're familiar with this uh, mean, mean squared fluctuation. So, uh, and if you take a square root, of course, it's the root mean squared fluctuation. But the mean squared fluctuation, well, it turns out that the mean squared fluctuation is actually related to the specific heat. I'm not sure whether you have actually studied this or covered this in your course, uh, at St. Xavier's, but uh, this is actually a central and important uh, result and uh, not very hard to prove. And I'll try to prove an analogous result as we go ahead. Similarly, if you go to the uh, 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 situation in which neither energy nor N are fixed, one has a grand canonical ensemble then and a grand canonical partition function, which I'll call capital Z. It's a function of T and the chemical potential mu, and it's given by a Boltzmann weight again, except the energy has a contribution from mu and N also. This time, if I take a log of Z, what I get is the pressure of the system. And so it's either entropy or free energy or pressure, depending on what is being held fixed. Now, this time, both energy and number are fluctuating, right? 
Energy fluctuations we've said are related to specific. What, what about number fluctuations? Here they are, n squared average minus n average squared. They relate to compressibility. Notice that both specific heat and compressibility are response functions. Okay, I'll, I'll elaborate on that as we go ahead. And so what we're saying is that fluctuations relate to response. How can we go ahead and find the response? So, so let, let's just uh, think uh, uh, of what we do in statistical mechanics. In equilibrium, we know we have a Boltzmann weight. We need to normalize by a partition function here. And uh, the average value of any quantity is given by the value in that configuration times the weight of that configuration and sum over all, all possibilities. So for instance, if I'm talking about the magnetization of a, in a magnetic system, and if I have a magnetic field H, the energy of the configuration needs to account for that uh, fact that I have the field H, so this becomes E, what it was in the absence of a field, and this term. And then, of course, I can uh, ask for what the magnetization is in the presence of the field. Okay, so the, the point I'm trying to make, never mind all this uh, formalism, the point I'm trying to make is that you had a system, it did not have, uh, maybe it had a field, maybe it did not, but now I'm changing the field a little bit by, uh, by a small amount h, and I'm asking for the change of magnetization. So therefore, I look, look at the last line here. I'm looking at d by dh, dm by dh. You know, how much does the magnetization change simply because I added this field? So that is known as the magnetic susceptibility. And within statistical, statistical mechanics, you know, we, will be, we should be able to at least formulate this, if not calculate it. Right. So let me come to response functions in general. So how does a system respond when conditions are changed? For instance, we've already seen that when a field is applied, the magnetization changes. So the way the, uh, the response, how much the magnetization changes, tells you what measured by the susceptibility. Okay, here I've just taken some random data uh, from uh, the literature the scientific literature, which shows M versus H in a copper manganese alloy. And you can see that depending on the precise alloy, the moment you put on a field, there's a response. The magnetization climbs up. And that response is uh, uh, what we are trying to uh, uh, characterize. That is the susceptibility. Now, suppose I had a completely different system, like a fluid. Okay. And I have a volume per particle, which is little v, and the pressure p. The moment I apply a pressure, the volume will change, right? And uh, the amount it changes is a measure of the compressibility. So the compressibility is proportional to dv by dp. Likewise, if I add a little heat to a system, the temperature will go up, and uh, the amount it goes up, I mean, if I add an amount of TDS of heat to the system, and I ask, uh, you know, how, uh, 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 how is that related to the temperature rise? The answer is a specific heat. So the point I'm trying to make is that susceptibility, compressibility, specific heat are all response functions. They, they, they're called response functions because they measure response. Now, good. Now, I want you to do a thought experiment. Right. I have a fluid, and I ask you to measure the compressibility. What would you do? Well, you might run to the lab. You might put on, uh, you know, uh, change the pressure a little bit, measure the volume. That's one way to measure the response. But I'm claiming that you need not. You need not put on any field at all. Don't put on a field. Take the system as is, no field. And yet I can predict the response. How? Well, answer, monitor the fluctuations. Look at the fluctuations. And the fluctuations will determine the response. So you can find 
response functions without applying a field by monitoring the fluctuations in the original system. So this is just telling you how these uh, relations go. Compressibility is proportional to the fluctuations of number uh, square. Of course, the, the mean squared fluctuations of number. The susceptibility is proportional to mean squared fluctuations of the magnetization. The specific heat to mean squared fluctuations of the energy. Okay, so this is a very um, important and very general form of what you might call a fluctuation response relation. It also bears on something that is very well known in physics, namely the fluctuation dissipation relation. Namely, fluctuations also determine how much dissipation, how much energy is dissipated in the system, but that, that, that is not something that I will dwell on at all today. Well, uh, here is a derivation of this, uh, uh, let's say, the formula for susceptibility. And uh, I realize that a talk like this is not the place to give a derivation of this sort. So my purpose in showing this to you is to tell you that it is possible in, in about three lines to derive this formula, that the susceptibility is related to the magnetization fluctuations in this way. Okay, and uh, you know, perhaps uh, since the, the, there is a, a question and discussion session planned later, uh, perhaps we can uh, uh, you know, go through these three lines if there is interest later. Okay, what I wanted to come back to or go back to is the year 1905, a great year for physics because there were three very, uh, uh, what should I say, earth-shaking papers that were written in that year by a person whose name I've not put down here. The same person appears in the logo of the Society of Phys Physics. And the name is not put down there. <laughs> so, well, I think you all know who, who it is. So let me break the suspense. It's Einstein. <laughs> I know there was no suspense there. But uh, I wanted to point out the following. That in 1905, he, Einstein wrote this epoch-making paper on what, what is now known as Brown, what he called also Brownian motion. And he pointed out that because fluctuations are related to response, this fact gives you a way to find Avogadro's number. Let me take you through the logic very quickly. Uh, let, uh, let me skip a little bit of this and point out that uh, if you, okay, well, I mean, uh, you, you can find uh, a, a, a very simple equation for the uh, uh, relation between the uh, terminal velocity, which is due to uh, an applied field, let's say gravity, and uh, the diffusion constant d. The diffusion constant is a constant which tells you how much a given particle will move uh, as it uh, uh, is subject to random forces. So for instance, if I have a colloidal particle in a beaker, it's buffeted all the time by molecules around it, and it does uh, rather random motion. So on the right you, here you see uh, a graph with some random looking tracks. So these are tracks which were actu actually uh, obtained from experiment. I'll tell you about them in a minute. But this experiment was done in response to a suggestion from Einstein. What Einstein suggested is that, okay, so, so uh, Einstein's observation was that through a, a simple uh, 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 matching of uh, uh, the, the exponential form of the way the density profile decays in a, in a gravitational or external field, by matching these forms, you can derive a relation between, as I said, the diffusion constant, which tells you about these tracks, and the left-hand side. Now, see, look at the left-hand side. That is k times t. K, is, K sub B is Boltzmann's constant. Today we know the value. 
But remember, the Boltzmann constant is the gas constant divided by the Avogadro number. The big unknown then was the Avogadro number. So K was equally unknown. So Einstein's proposal was go measure D, use uh, this relation to find K or equivalently to find the Avogadro number. Okay. And this, uh, so he said, it is to be hoped that some inquirer may succeed shortly in solving the problem suggested here, which is so important in connection with the theory of heat. But notice that what underlies the whole thing is a balance between an applied force and this, ran this random motion due to fluctuations. So it's the relation between fluctuations and response that was uh, at the heart of Einstein's proposal. Okay, just to complete the story, Perrin, uh, Jean Perrin, uh, French experimentalist, took up this challenge. He actually took up the challenge of measuring the diffusion constant by following individual tracks of colloidal particles, of course, hundreds of such tracks, um, as a function of... Uh, uh, so, so this is space in two dimensions. And this is at, so at equal intervals of time, he measured the location of the particle and found this rather random looking track. Here are some more tracks that he just put down here. Uh, by carefully measuring the displacement of the particle, you see the particle has displaced from the start to the end, but it has not gone in a straight line. It has gone in anything but a straight line. It's gone up and down and left and right and right and left and up and down and so on and so forth until it reached that point. This sort of motion is called a random walk. And the way the, mean, the uh, displacement of, say, so if you do this experiment once, you'll get one answer for your displacement. If you do it a second time, you'll get a totally different answer because there's no predicting exactly where the particle will land up. But by carefully measuring many, many, many such tracks, you can find the mean squared displacement. How much is it? You know, it's a fluctuation problem. How, uh, how large is the mean squared uh, displacement? And that gives you the diffusion constant that Einstein wanted. And that then gives you a way to find the Avogadro number. So this is a... Uh, uh, um, the uh, uh, accomplishment of Perra. I just wanted to point out one very prescient uh, uh, point that he made, and he said that if you look at a given, um, you know, segment of this uh, erratic curve, you might be tempted to assign a velocity of the particle between this point and that point, because after all, there's a distance and there's a time. You can divide one by the other. But he said, please don't do that. That would be grossly wrong. Uh, here we are. Such evaluations are grossly wrong. Because, and the reason they are wrong, is that if the particle, if you track the particle more finely, you know, 100 times more finely than here, you would find that this segment that you think is a straight line, because you've joined it by a straight line, is actually not a straight line, but something as complicated as this here. And so the distance between these, followed by the particle, is much, much, much larger than appears to the eye. OK. So this is a, what we today call a fractal. It's a statistical fractal. And uh, fractals underlie many, many interesting behaviors uh, you know, to be found in physics and in nature. Uh, whether you're talking about mountain ranges, whether you're talking about strengths of earthquakes, whether you're talking about um, the sizes of clusters and critical phenomena, fractals are at the heart of it. Uh, right, so I'll uh, leave this slide by, uh, you know, just uh, saying that in addition to finding uh, Avogadro's number, perhaps the most important thing that Perra's uh, tracks accomplished was to establish what he called, and what I will also therefore repeat and call, molecular reality. You see, at that point, 1909 or so, 
there were still people, and these are well-established scientists, for instance, Mark, uh, uh, you know, of the Mark number and others, who disbelieved that there are objects such as molecules. I mean, who, they, they, their attitude was, who said there are molecules? I mean, this is a fiction. Nobody has seen one. You know, so uh, uh, this, once Perrin published these tracks, there was no other credible explanation for these erratic movements other than that this particle was being bombarded by molecules. And this helped establish what one would call molecular reality. So at this point, let me have an interlude and ask for questions. Are there any questions, especially from the students, but from anybody at all? Uh, if there are, please ask right away and it will really help uh, me and perhaps you. So. Yes, sir, there are questions. Uh, Shatish Kumar, uh, do you want to unmute and ask? Yeah, please uh, go ahead, Shatish Kumar. Okay, I can't hear. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, now I can. Yes. Yeah, please go Sir, ahead. why why are enzymes related to potential? Why we can why we say potential? No, I I didn't catch the question. Why what? Why are enzymes is related to potential, sir? Uh, so okay. micro okay. can you related to potential? Sorry, can you repeat again? Why is enzymes related to? Why so are why? samples related to uh, potential? Huh. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, why are samples related to uh, uh, things like entropy, uh, Helmholtz free energy? Is that what you mean? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Uh, see, so it, it goes back to this. See, on the left hand side, for instance, look at the formula for capital Q. Okay. So we have Q is a sum of all configurations with the something something here that we have. But it turns out that this sum over all configurations, of course, is in principle dominated predominantly only by uh, 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 a set of configurations, which is a very small set compared to the full set of configurations. It is dominated by that set, which uh, 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 has an internal. Uh, okay, which of, so see of course so, so uh, uh, it is dominated by that set of configurations, which has a contribution. Okay, so let, let, let me explain it like this. Let, look at the left hand side. You have e to the minus e by kt there, right? Capital E is proportional, is an extensive quantity. Now, in this sum over C, is, is so you think of classifying the configurations into different sets. Uh, there is a set with a given value of E, okay, associated with which you have a uh, uh, a certain number which implies a certain entropy. So what I'm getting at is that when, when, when this uh, sum over C is being done, it's actually only that um, uh, set which has the, the value of the entropy that's consistent with the energy in the microcanonical ensemble that contributes. So so there is a postulate here. The postulate is in the microcanonical ensemble that the entropy is actually given by this. But once you have that postulate, the rest are derived. You see? Uh, uh, okay. Uh, I, I'll need to write something, but uh, I, I can't do it now. Maybe in the question answer session, we'll come back to this and I'll try to explain what I'm saying a little better. So, but just to summarize again, uh, I know I'm not being terribly clear. Uh, the, with the postulate that the entropy is be, uh, given by the log of capital omega, it is no longer a further assumption. It's, it's, you can derive the fact that the Helmholtz free energy is actually given by 
the log of the partition function and that the pressure is given by the log of z because of the fact that I mentioned that uh, the uh, dominance of those uh, configurations uh, uh, ensures that. Okay, but uh, let, let, I mean, I cannot uh, explain it without writing something on the blackboard or on some paper, which I will do later. Okay, thank you for the question. Any other question? Yeah, so we had one from YouTube, uh, like uh, it was from Saeed Ahmed. How response function is different from correlation? Okay, a response function is different from the correlation in the sense that it's a question of definition. Uh, okay, let me go back. So let me do the following. Yeah, so actually, I, again, in my discussion part of my talk, which is far, uh, unfortunately, at the end, I have a very precise uh, relation between correlation and response. And the, the, so the response, let me repeat. Okay, let me see where we had this slide. Tells you how a particular quantity, like the total magnetization of the system, changes when you change the magnetic field, right? You could choose to look at a very uh, different thing. Okay, so here we are. You could think of, imagine, it's, it's a thought experiment. Think of adding a magnetic field, not to the whole sample, but only at a given point, right? And then you can ask for the response of the local magnetization uh, at some other point, you know, marked by this arrow, because I put on a field here, right? It turns out that, so, so the res by response I mean how much this con uh, the local magnetization changes because I put on the field there. So dm2 uh, by dh1, okay, this is the response. So that's the definition of re response. But it's directly related to the correlation between the two uh, uh, quantities, namely to the average of S i S S one S two minus average S i S. So the, so the answer is that the two quantities are different in terms of definitions, but in fact they are very strongly related. They are equal up to a proportionality constant, but you know conceptually and definition wise they're different. Right. Uh, is that a satisfactory answer? If you have more questions, ask. Uh, yeah. So there was uh, one question from Neil. Neil, do you want to unmute and ask? Uh, so, uh, so what, uh, what was the experimental procedure behind uh, calculating the diffusion, diffusion constant by measuring the individual particles? How was it done? And uh, can you replicate that in say an undergraduate lab with oh. a compound microscope with answer pollen? Right. Water? You mean, uh, how can I add a field here? And, oh, no, uh, no, no, no. I was talking about uh, the, the, the experimental uh, procedure of determining the diffusion constant. In, uh, oh, for, the diffusion constant. Motion. All right. Yeah, okay. I, I, you, you know what uh, Perrin did is uh, uh, very simple. Okay, the procedure was something like this. So he had a microscope, and on the microscope he had a grid. You know, uh, on, so there was a grid, and he, he focused on one particle uh, at a time, and he just, at equal intervals of time, I think it was a few seconds between the uh, observations, he had, so he would call out the coordinates of the particle as observed on the grid, and an assistant would uh, note these down on graph paper. Okay, so at the end of the day, I mean, he, uh, every, let's say, 10 seconds, he would uh, measure the location of the particle. He would look at the coordinates, the XY coordinates of the particle on the plate, and uh, call out the coordinates. Those would be entered by his uh, assistant, and uh, he would do it again and again and again till the, till, you know, till um, uh, for for a certain number of steps. At the end of that, he would repeat the whole thing many hundreds of times. So, actually, I don't know how how often he did, but many dozen times, you know, over and over again. By doing that, what you would finally get is a graph or, a, 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 you know, the way the mean squared displacement, uh, the dis displacement of the particle, square it and take the mean over all realizations, 
how the mean square displacement changes in time, with time. That proportionality constant is the diffusion constant. Uh, thank you, sir. Okay, shall we carry on at the moment, you know, yes. and yes. We'll come back to all questions at the end? Is that okay? Yes, sir. Because I see I'm rap rapidly running out of time. Is that, will that be okay, with organizers? Yes, of course, sir. Yeah, so let's go ahead. So, interview uh, is over. So, yes. also uh, 10 minutes before the... <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> well, so I will beg the indulgence of the... Um, organizers and make maybe exceed the 10 minutes a little bit but, but uh, you know uh, I'll, I'll try I'll try I'll try thank you thank you for the reminder no problem yeah okay we, we, yeah we will see where we go and uh, you know we'll just stop when when the time is up okay then let's go ahead so I come to the discussion of critical phenomena and here I wanted to quote something which I find very nicely written by two Russians, Patashinsky and Pokrovsky. They are talking about fluctuations and they're talking about fluctuations at a critical point. And what they say is that when fluctuations, these shapeless amoeba, overlap in large numbers to form a continuous, undescribable soup, at that point, new and sharply defined laws like scaling come into play cutting through the chaos. So you might think that, you know, when things are random and fluctuating and so on, there's nothing much we can say, but it's actually not true. It's the converse. We can say something very precise, very sharp, and, uh, and it's because fluctuations have the nature. They do. So let's uh, go ahead. So I remind you of the phase diagram of a simple fluid. There's a, uh, fl no, not fluid, a, sim a simple, uh, matter, there's a solid phase, a liquid phase, a gas phase, and whereas the solid and liquid phase uh, line will continue, I mean, it will not ever stop in, at a critical point for the reason that can be left to the questions, but uh, it's very interesting. There's no critical point between a solid and a liquid, but there is between liquid and vapor. There can be and is a critical point. It's the point at which this line of first order transitions terminates. So these, these are, as you cross this line, liquid to gas, you have boiling. And boiling is a commonplace phenomenon for us in the kitchen, but it's actually quite surprising from the point of view of molecules, because it's at a certain temperature or pressure, all of them fly apart. I mean, as you know, the density of water is about 1700, 1700 times the density of uh, steam. So every, mo and you know, the cube root of 1700 is about 12. So every molecule is about 12 times further away from, on average, from its neighbors than it was in the uh, liquid phase. How do all the molecules know that they all ought to do this at the same time? You know, this is the mystery of phase transitions that happens. But n nevertheless, um, uh, the phase transitions, which have these jumps of the density, the jumps go to zero at the critical point, and the distinction between the phases disappears. At that point, the physics is dominated by fluctuations. Now, what does it mean? Okay, just to remind you, in 1869 was the first evidence that there is a terminus of a line like this. This was in carbon dioxide experiment done by Andrews. And you will find this uh, data that he has for the pressure volume curves. And you see that there are jumps here, no jumps at very high uh, temperatures. But uh, somewhere, here, somewhere here, there is a point at which the jump cease. Now, it turns out that if you look at the critical point, what you find is that it is dominated by fluctuations. And what do I mean by that? I mean the following. So let's imagine we have this uh, system of ours of spins here. Here's spin SI, here is spin at some other location, I plus R, spin at I plus R. And I can look at this correlation between the spins at I and I plus R, okay? Typically, this correlation will decay, it will fall, and it will fall exponentially. E raised to minus R divided by Xi. This is the Greek letter Xi, which denotes a correlation length. 
what does psi tell us physically? It tells us something about the spatial extent of fluctuations. Because, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you are at distances much larger than psi, this is practically zero. And, uh, you know, you just have a bland uh, zero at the end of this, which tells you that there is no correlation between this and something very far away. Because the size, the size of the typical fluctuations that distance. So the size, in fact, is given by psi. So it's this measure of the spatial extent of fluctuations. It's the uh, uh, size below which you will see ex good, very strong correlations and above which you see no correlations, roughly speaking. But this length itself, psi itself, is very strongly dependent on temperature. And it approaches infinity as you approach the critical point. This is remarkable because it is saying that at the critical point, things that are very far away are also begin to get quite correlated. Actually, there is a correction to this form and these correlations do fall. They fall, but they fall very slowly. They fall as a power law, as I've shown here, uh, lower in the um, uh, transfer uh, in uh, on this slide, they fall as a power law, which can is a very, very slow decay. So if you look at the typical state, this blue and red plot, right? Blue, you can imagine are upspins. Red, you can imagine are downspins. Okay? So you see clusters, and these clusters are very big. And inside the clusters, there are other clusters. And inside those, there are other clusters, and so on and so forth. These actually... Now the next, this is the second time we encounter in this talk the notion of fractals. These are self-similar. When you do a scaling of space, you will find that the same pattern repeats itself. I mean, when you expand or contract. This is uh, uh, the heart of the matter as far as scaling is concerned. The uh, point you, so you should note is that, first of all, you see something very patchy. But if you look at these connected regions of blue, they're very, very large. And they're very large because you're at criticality and because the correlation length has become infinite. OK, let me move ahead. A very direct uh, experimental uh, 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 evidence of this comes from the phenomenon of critical opalescence, which is the fact that if you take either a liquid vapor system or better still a binary liquid, which has a constant point, and as you pass through that consulate point, what you find is that light, which came through very easily through your sample, uh, you know, at other temperatures, near the critical temperature, the light doesn't come through easily. The uh, transparent solution, a uh, 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 transparent, um, you know, mixture appears actually very milky. And uh, th this phenomenon is called opalescence. And if you think about why it becomes milky, it's because light is being... And remember, the wave is the spacing between molecules, so that now the density fluctuations have become as large as a thousand times the mean spacing already, you know, by the time you see this critical opalescence. There's a very nice YouTube uh, demonstration of this that you can find cyclohexane methanol mixture, which shows this. Okay, now I realize that I'm uh, out of time. Uh, right, so um, uh, what I will do is I will very quickly, you know, in about five minutes, go through the rest of the talk and tell you what it is that I would have told you in more detail uh, had there been more time, but then uh, it's fine. I, you know, it's, it's better to speak, uh, you know, uh, try to be clear at least about some a fewer things than to be unclear about all. So let's uh, proceed. So wh wh what I mean by fluctuations in time is I'm asking what happens to a particular fluctuation as time passes. Usually a fluctuation that forms will just damp down and go away. But sometimes fluctuations become larger and larger and larger. When do they do that? For instance, 
if you have a situation where you have a, 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 you know a, the environment which promotes the growth of ordered phases then, then as time passes fluctuations of two uh, color here i have drawn them as two colors of two uh, different uh, species grow in t oh, i'm sorry grow in time and uh, they grow in this uh, way you know and this phenomenon is you know called uh, coarsening the fact that the patterns that you see become coarser and coarser leads to this name very interesting scaling um, of, uh, of these uh, patterns is also observed but we will skip this point totally right now go ahead now suppose you have in fact growing fluctuations in other types of systems like in traffic or crowds or even stock market these fluctuations can cause somewhat undesirable consequences like in traffic a small density fluctuation of cars can lead to a traffic jam in a crowd this can actually cause a stampede in a stock market the wrong sort of fluctuation can lead to a crash so can statistical physics provide methods to avoid these this is what i would have liked to tell you all about in some detail but let me do it fast so here are two pictures these are cars moving you know the tail lights of cars and here are people uh, walking on a platform and uh, the point i wanted to bring out is that both these systems are actually current carrying systems i mean there is drift there is motion in one direction and uh, from a general study of current carrying systems one knows that fluctuations in these systems actually behave quite differently in general from fluctuations in normal equilibrium systems so that knowledge we have from statistical mechanics can be put to use in these systems as well so the point is that we have a, a, a current in both these cases but the carriers of the currents a people in this case the cars when they rather individualistic uh, here is a simple physics model of traffic which i will not elaborate on other than to say that uh, it actually is much more successful than you might think it to be it's called the nagel schreffenberg model what you imagine is that the road or the space is broken up into um, cells or boxes which are little bigger than the size of a car and then you can invoke uh, simple rules which uh, in, incorporate acceleration uh, etc etc in this uh, highway but uh, on this uh, road but uh, the it turns out it, it turns out that the crucial ingredient beyond of course acceleration and slowing down and so on to avoid impact is to incorporate unpredictability you know if if, if you've ever driven especially in bombay or um, uh anywhere you know you know that the person in front who's driving very well will unpredictably you know apply a brake so this you know random braking and random uh, things that happen are crucial to incorporate and when you do that you can actually reproduce very well the nature of uh, traffic flows uh, in real systems so precisely this model of course uh, uh, dressed up uh, uh, somewhat to be uh, little uh, more realistic but with the same flavor as this model has been used uh, on you know the german highways to make predictions of how traffic will um flow in, i mean w w what is a better route to take let's say between two sides uh so i'm rushing through a little bit i mean i'll be happy to elaborate uh, later but let let me move on let me come to this question of crowds you know many people trying to move in you know so the the uh, uh traffic i mean the, the, there's been a lot of work in uh, engineering departments on you know movement of people and traffic in in the, in the old days but uh, the physics approach is to look at each um you know to use an individual based approach allowing for each individual to move ahead as she or he pleases except that there are certain uh, constraints that people don't like to be too close to each other people like to be able to see across etc etc putting these uh, into simple uh, simulational models actually produces reasonably reasonably good 
um, uh, descriptions of crowds. Now, in terms of crowds, people, I should not say crowds, I should say people are, are quite uh, illogical when it comes to doing things. I mean, we know that. You know, we are all, uh, we all pray to that. So, uh, these are the uh, uh, sort of natural tendencies that the model uh, tries to incorporate. But uh, the consequences are quite uh, strange and they're illogical, but they're actually uh, the sorts of things that people do. If you widen a corridor, it actually slows down exits. If you place obstacles, you know, in front of, you know, not randomly, but uh, in, in a carefully thought out way, obstacles actually speed up the flow rather than restricting it. And if you have empty exits, people will avoid them, they'll go to the crowded one. You know, so it's things like this. Have these worked? Or do these things work at all? It turns out they do. Statistical physics actually saves lives, has saved lives. How? Why? You, you, you all know about the Hajj pilgrimage, which happens uh, annually in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, there used to be, you know, a, a certain part of that, the rituals or something called the pillar stoning ritual. And there, invariably, there would be many, many deaths due to stampedes. Well, the Saudi authorities consulted uh, 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 a statistical physicist who used to model um, uh, crowd behavior through simulations. And uh, his name is D Dirk Helbing. And they consulted other, uh, others also. But these people actually came up with a simple, uh, you know, they were able to use their simulational models to be able to see what to do in order to avoid a stampede. I mean, uh, it, I mean, there's a very nice story that goes with this, but uh, let me not uh, get into that. Um, they were able to identify the transition in behavior that happens. It's a precursor to the stampede. They were able to identify the precursor and to, the, to uh, design things such that that precursor would not occur. And if the precursor doesn't occur, then the stampede doesn't occur either. So th there was a new design of the bridge. And after, after 2007, when this was implemented, there's been a drastic fall in casualties uh, there uh, at, 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 during the uh, Hajj. OK, this is the last slide. I'm really sorry to have exceeded the time. But uh, I, my conclusion is very simple. I mean, I wanted to tell you all only one thing, that fluctuations are at the heart of all statistical systems. You know, averages are good, average relate to averages relate to thermodynamics, they allow you to make contact with experiment and so on. But it's fluctuations which tell you how the system behaves, how the system responds. These fluctuations allow you to, you know, also do uh, find strange things like Avogadro number. You found through a fluctuation response relation, critical phenomena, you know, uh, uh, central problem in statistical physics is uh, controlled by fluctuations. And finally, you know, as uh, uh, coming to everyday life, uh, curbing, if, if one understands how to curb uh, uncontrolled growth of fluctuations, that, of course, is desirable in some instances, for instance, in traffic and in crowds, and it uh, can actually save lives. Okay, so with this, uh, let me end the talk. Thank you all for listening so patiently. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we have a few questions, so... Right. Yeah, so I'll be happy to take them. Should I... Um, come back on screen or, or not? Maybe not, because it's too much of a risk. I mean, I may not be able to go back. So, uh, so, so ca can I take the questions without uh, coming on screen right now? Yes, yeah. yes, sir. I think that's all right. You could do that. Yeah. So, uh, Yash had a question. Uh, Yash, do you want to unmute and ask the question? Yes, I uh, I haven't heard actually. I can't hear. Uh, 
Yash had a question, but then like uh, Yash, can you unmute and ask a question, or should I ask a question for you? I think Bajan, you could go ahead and ask the question. I think he's left the room or something, maybe. So his question was: Is there any experiment we can do to find the response and fluctuations by using averages? Is it uh, is there any experiment we can do in order to find what? Is there any experiment we can do to find response and fluctuations by using averages? <laughs> well. Uh... See, um, uh, how do I answer this? Yeah. Um, in the end, when I'm talking about fluctuations, I'm talking about an average. But it's the average of the mean squared deviation. So let me just go back to that uh, early slide. You know, when I'm talking about uh, delta n squared here, what is delta n? It is the deviation from the average. Okay, so in a particular realization, if I have a, a value n, n minus n average is indeed the fluctuation. What I'm doing is I'm gathering the fluctuations and squaring each of them. I'm adding them up uh, and then I'm, or, or if you like, I'm averaging them. So indeed you have to average a signal in order to find the fluctuation to, to, to assign a quantitative value uh, to the strength of the fluctuation so that you have to do it's a question of what you are averaging over if you are averaging over straight uh, 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 okay I don't know where, where that has gone but uh, if you are averaging over a quantity uh, uh, you know, like the number, the, what you'll find is the average number. So from the average number, you cannot find the uh, uh, fluctuation. Uh, but all, uh, I mean, it's true that you need to do an average over many realizations in order to find the strength of the fluctuation. So I think that would be my answer to this question. The next question is from uh, Prasoon. Uh, do you want to unmute and ask? Yeah. Good evening, sir. So I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. The phenomena which you explained, critical opal sense. Yes. Uh, is it a chaotic phen phenomena? Can we make a bifurcation diagram or logistic map out of it? Um, yeah. Again, I didn't catch the question. You're talking about critical opal sense. Now, what is the question exactly? Is it a uh, chaotic phenomena? No, not at all. It's, I mean, it, it's, a, it's not a chaotic phenomenon. It's a, I mean, okay, uh, it, 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 what is happening is very simple. Um, let, can I go back to my... See, look at this uh, slide and look at the, what I've plotted here. I've plotted the correlation length as a function of temperature, right? I mean, you see that graph. You see yes. these two blue lines, and the blue line is becoming very, very large at near TC. That means that the correlation length itself is becoming very large. Now, yes. what is the correlation length? So, the correlation length is a measure of, um, you can think of it like this, that if I, if I know that the, uh, uh, let's say that I have a, um, so let's think about a binary fluid, okay? So if I have a methanol a cyclohexane mixture and I know I have some methanol here, what is the likelihood that I'll have methanol uh, somewhere else? Well, so if you are within a range which is xi or less, then it's li more likely than not. It's not guaranteed, but it's more likely than not that you'll, you'll actually be methanol rich. Okay, so what is happening is that the, if you look at the density, if you look at the density of methanol and cyclohexane, that would be very well mixed away from the correlation, uh, away from the critical point. But as you approach the critical point, you're getting bigger and bigger droplets of one and the other, methanol rich or cyclohexane rich. Okay, 
Now, once these droplets become of the size of the wavelength of light, I mean, are comparable to the wavelength of light, you can get very efficient scattering. So the light is scattered by uh, uh, these density fluctuations. So what is happening in critical opalescence is that you are forming fluctuations of the density at larger and larger, on larger and larger length scales. And, and once the length scale becomes 1000 or so times the atomic spacing, namely it becomes of the order of wavelength of light, you see critical opalescence. That's all. So it's not really directly related to chaos in that sense. You know, I mean, um, at a colloquial level, you could say that the system is very chaotic because it's random. Yeah, that 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 you could say. But uh, chaos in the technical, physical, in the physics sense, I mean, is not at the heart of this phenomenon, as far as I can see. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay. Neil, do you want to unmute and ask the question? Uh, so, why do these phenomena, uh, in your opinion, scale all the way from uh, atoms to to crowds, and why do they use the same kind of math? How 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 is it so successful? Um, yeah, so it, uh, yeah, that, that's a very good uh, uh, question, and it, it's uh, it, I mean it requires an answer in parts. Um, first of all, let me. If, if, if you uh, will allow me, let me backtrack again and talk about fluids. Now, it turns out that if you look at the behavior of a fluid, like if you examine the equation of state very close to the critical point of a fluid, you will find a certain curve for the isotherm and so on and so forth. Um, you can do it for carbon dioxide, you can do it for nitrogen, you can do it for methanol, you can do it for any any liquid. You find exactly the same curve. Now, this is rather astounding because the value of Tc is changing all over the place. The value of Tc for methanol is certainly not equal to the value of Tc for oxygen. I mean, it's very different. You know, so the critical points are jumping all over the place. Like for helium, you know, the uh, uh, four degrees is when it, uh, 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 you know, four four point something degrees is when um, you have the liquid vapor critical point, four degrees, right? Come to water, that's uh, three hundred Kelvin. So it's a vast range of critical points, in spite of which there is this phenomenon which is very striking, it's called universality. In spite of this vast difference of uh, scales of temperature and of energy in these systems, what is common is the collective aspect. The fact that there are many, many, many molecules which are participating. That fact overrides these differences. See, the potential, uh, the intermolecular potential between two water molecules very different from the intermolecular potential between two helium atoms, right? In spite of that, this critical phenomena uh, aspect, namely the um, uh, shape of the isotherm and many, many other things, and not get, get, or the way the uh, compressibility diverges. Excuse me, sir. So, so this is my question. Uh, sir. Uh, yes. Sorry? Was there a question? Yeah. No, so what, what I'm trying to say is that, uh, can you hear me? Can I be heard? Uh, yes, sir, you're audible. Please continue. OK, I'm audible. All right, so the, 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 the point I'm trying to make is that the um, uh, uh, there is this universality of behavior amongst, uh, you know, at, at least a set of um, uh, uh, systems, namely almost all fluids. If you examine magnets, it turns out they have uh, their own set of uh, 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 universality, something that one of the important classes uh, in magnets has the same characterization, the same critical exponents as they're called as fluids. So the fact that you have a large number of objects doing some things helps to uh, 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 blur out 
the exact details of the system. Now, having said that, there are so, so the summary of what I'm saying is that there are many things that don't matter when it comes to uh, phenomena like this, but there are many things that do matter, okay? And uh, uh, the things that do matter are things like symmetry. The question is whether you have a system in equilibrium or not in equilibrium, and those things are important. So uh, the... When you are trying to model uh, a, a large system of a, a system of many people, of many um, uh, individuals uh, involved in a crowd, the nature of the interactions you may or may not capture exactly faithfully, you know, in your simulation. But the large scale behavior is often oblivious to whether or not you captured everything exactly. That 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 is what I'm. Uh, trying to argue. And that is why these models are very successful. It is not to say that the same, exactly the same behavior uh, uh, that characterizes a crowd or uh, as something in traffic, uh, fluctuations in traffic also characterize equilibrium systems. They don't. But the lessons we learn from how to analyze these systems cut across and we can use those. Okay, so that's that's the end of my answer. I... Yeah, so uh, so we'll have like one last question, and that is like while watching one of your YouTube videos, like it was an interview. I came across a story where while learning optics, you came across the commonly taught experiment of observing the image of a candle kept between two mirrors, and it's very often taught that the images are infinite. But then you wrote a letter to the author stating. Okay how infinite images are not possible because light was light has a finite speed that yes. actually shows how you think like before accepting and before accepting what is told to you and how you think beyond academics and that surely is a very important trait during your lectures you always say that it's not the answer but the question that matters Xavier yes. Xavier tries to promote such type of learning and it's evident in the syllabus and that is also the motto of the society of physics on that note what advice would you give to the young scientists who are present here? Yeah, I think, um, well, a uh, couple of things. I mean, see, uh, whatever you do will be on the shoulders of what has happened before. I mean, there are m many, uh, you know, like uh, Newton said, I, I stand on the shoulders of giants and uh, it was Newton, right? I mean, who said this? Can, can somebody correct me? Or uh, who uh, and, and uh, who said that this is why I'm able to see uh, as far as I do? Um, so there's a body of knowledge that has accumulated, right? So that we cannot uh, uh, certainly, as students, you should not ignore. You should uh, look at it. The, the thing is uh, that when you approach uh, something new, new for you, I mean, even although it's known uh, elsewhere, approach it and in a way that you try to understand it in as simple a way as possible, you know, to yourself at least. Um, simple is good, you know. So, uh, you know, I, I often find that students miss this point. And they are often enamored of very complicated, very large uh, formulae, which uh, appear impressive because of some of, of the mathematical niceties or whatever. Those are, of course, have their own beauty and are very good. But the, the true test is, can you explain, at least to yourself and maybe to others, what is going on in simple English terms, you know, without... Uh, uh, necessarily, you know, ha having to rely on, you know, more complicated uh, concepts. So often uh, when uh, talking to my research students, I often advise them, you know, write a sentence, write two sentences to say what it is that you've understood and how is it and how have you understood it. And that exercise, if you try to do, 
I mean, you'll find that it pays off because that you you find that what you thought you understood rather well uh, is actually a little hazy. So I would, you know, my first advice, first bit of advice would be try to be very uh, clear uh, in what you have understood, what you have not. You know, at any given point of time, you'll find that there's some things you understand very well, and you you know you you there's no doubt about it. There are also some things which are a little murky. You know, I don't understand it totally, but I understand it in some way. Okay, that's good enough. Keep it in your mind, and as time goes by, you will find occasions. You will find uh, times at which uh, something or the other illuminates. Uh, you know, a candle here. Um, will shed light on you know, something a uh, uh, dark corner of your mind elsewhere. So you, uh, so keep your, uh, keep track of what you understand well, so and what you what you don't. And as time goes by, what you don't will become what you do. The other last thing I would say is, uh, uh, you know, be critical. Be critical in the sense that you know, don't take everything as gospel truth because it comes from authority. And authority is often wrong, you know. I mean, and wrong, the word wrong has many, is a nuanced word. It, you can be wrong in an interesting way. You can be wrong in a not very interesting way. You, you'll have all heard of the physicist Pauli, right? Wolfgang Pauli. I mean, uh, yes, sir. The Pauli exclusion principle. Okay, you know. So, amongst other things, Pauli had a very scathing, um, you know, uh, way of putting things. You know. So, once there was a seminar speaker. I don't know who it was, and uh, people asked Pauli later, "How did you like the seminar?" He said, "Wow, it was. He wasn't. Uh, it wasn't even wrong. You know. So." Wrong is not the worst thing you can be. It wasn't even wrong. What he meant is, is, I mean, it was not interesting. I mean, you can be right about something which is not interesting. That 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 is not as good. Certainly not as good as being wrong about something that is interesting and being wrong in an interesting way. So, uh, you know, that that, that 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 is what I would say. Uh, uh, because please don't try to be wrong in an interesting way. Try to be right in an interesting way, okay, as you go ahead. Uh, but uh, uh, being uh, wrong is not the end of the world. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the world is full of mistakes, and uh, mistakes have their own uh, lessons, you know, and uh, we should go ahead. Uh, so be critical. Be, see if you understand things in your own way. If you don't, you know, at some point, you know, when you have enough confidence, if you don't understand it in your own way, maybe you can say, okay, I don't understand it, so it must be wrong. But to reach a state like that, you'd better be very, very sure of yourself. So try not to do that. Don't, don't, don't jump to that. But, you know, aspire to be, you know, have ways of looking at things that so that you understand uh, things in your own way. All right. Okay, I've spoken long, long enough. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, no, that no. was uh, really very helpful, especially for us when it's coming from someone who's been in Xavier's and then has reached where you are. It is really very inspiring for us as students and motivating, for, motivating us to you know, uh, break all barriers and to do whatever it takes. So, uh, thank you so much for that. As a concluding remark, we would really like Bodhne ma'am to say something if she has a proper network that is. Bodhne ma'am, are you still there? Can you... E yes, ma'am. I hope just in again. I'm not audible, ma'am.
Ma'am, you're on mute. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Now we can. Uh, I'm saying I'm actually first thing is I would like to say sorry to Professor Verma that for more than a year now I'm after him to come and talk to our students even though I know you. Uh, yeah, can I respond? No, no need to say sorry. I mean, uh, this year has been a rather different year from other years. Uh, February onward, we have been uh, down with, uh, you know, COVID. I mean, not not literally down with COVID, but I mean, you know, that has affected everything. And uh, I mean, I would like to reiterate my thanks to you. Uh, okay, I could not catch that. Can uh, the organizers? Uh, Ma'am. Uh, Ma'am is not very clearly audible, sir. Okay, um, okay. There's a lot of network issues from where she's talking right now. Sir. Right. Uh, Bodhne, ma'am, can you hear us? <laughs> ma'am, your audio is breaking. So. Hello, Emma. Yeah, now I now we can hear. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. See, uh, sir, sir has given a very very good. He uh, talked about fluctuations of fluctuations where. Undergraduate level in our syllabus, we keep the fluctuations outside saying that they're too small, and so we just talk about the average values. And now, I, with uh, what Sir has uh, just now discussed about the importance of fluctuations, our students must have definitely got a good idea about the scope of statistical mechanics much beyond the level that we take them to in undergraduate level. So, thanks a lot, Sir. Uh, I'm personally my. Uh, on behalf of my students and our department, I'm very much thankful to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. I really enjoyed being here, you know, and uh, enjoyed the, you know preparing for the talk, giving the talk, and also the questions. And um, you know, I thank uh, all of you all be, for being present in spite of this being a holiday for you.